Hello, my name is Leslie Winnick, Director of Alumni and Student Class Outreach at the Stanford Alumni Association. I'm so glad you'll be able to tune in to today's interview with NASA astronaut Dr. Kathleen Rubens, live from the International Space Station. This interview will be conducted by Kevin Cool, editor of Stanford Magazine, which is produced by the Stanford Alumni Association. Dr. Kathleen Rubens was selected by NASA in 2009 and is the 46th American woman to go to space. She received her Bachelor of Science in Molecular Biology in 1999 from the University of California, San Diego, and her PhD in Cancer Biology from Stanford in 2005. In her career, Dr. Rubens has helped create therapies for Ebola and Lassa viruses by conducting collaborative research with the United States Army. She also aided development of the first smallpox infection model with the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Rubens has published and presented her work in numerous papers at international scientific conferences and in scientific journals. Thank you again for joining us today. Enjoy the interview. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. Okay, CSU Radio, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Check, check, check. One, two, three. Hey, I've got you loud and clear from the International Space Station. Good morning, Dr. Rubens. Hey, how are you? It's very nice to talk to you. Very nice to talk to you, and thank you for joining us. Could you tell us, where are you in the space station right now? What is this we're looking at? Yeah, so I'm in the U.S. laboratory. Um, this is just about the uh, center forward part of the space station. And as you can tell, it's uh, absolutely a working laboratory. We have experiments all over the place. Uh, that's really what we spend a lot of time on in microgravity is uh, doing all kinds of scientific experiments. And so uh, the different thing about this laboratory is instead of just having experiments on the benches, you have it on the walls and the ceiling as well. You can see that everywhere. Absolutely. So what will you be doing today? Is this a typical day for you? And, and what does a typical day consist of? Yeah, a typical day in space is pretty much anything and everything. Uh, I'm going to be doing an experiment right after we finish chatting, uh, actually, to try to understand how fluids move around in tubes up here. Uh, so one of the really fascinating things in microgravity is that fluids are no longer subjected to the force of, of gravity pulling them down. So they form balls, uh, they, they float and uh, we do have things like surface tension that still take over as dominant variables. And so we're going to take a look at some modern molecular biology tools and try to understand how fluids are behaving in this weightless environment. I see. We're very interested in the, the experiments that you've been conducting and the science that goes on. I wonder if first if we could just get a little bit of uh, information from you about your own path to becoming an astronaut. Your, your training was in microbiology. What motivated you to pursue astronaut training? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, I always say that, that astronaut training is not something that you find. Uh, it really, it's, uh, are you uh, just lucky enough uh, eventually to be chosen for this? There's a lot of people that want to do this job. And um, it's a little bit, I think, like winning the lottery some days to get the chance to leave the planet. I have always wanted to be a scientist, and I was pretty uh, solidly working towards that as a career. I uh, did my graduate studies at Stanford and then had a lab at the Whitehead Institute at MIT and decided to apply for uh, astronaut applications because it was something I wanted to do ever since I was a small child but uh, doesn't really seem to fit in that completely realistic career possibility path. Um, I think the lesson is take a chance and, and see what you can find. You never know where you're going to end up. Right. So you've been in space now three months. We're wondering 
What has been easier than you expected, and what has been harder than you expected? So it actually was a lot harder when I first got up here just to learn how to move around and uh, stabilize yourself. Uh, the mission control folks kind of joke when you get new astronauts on board that they end up crawling on the floor of the space station. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be a crawler. And <laughs> it turns out in your first few weeks, you cannot move yourself from one place to the other because the space station is in free fall. You're in free fall. Um, it, this is not something that you've ever had in your human experience. And it's a little bit like learning how to walk again. Uh, you end up uh, at some point you get, you get pretty good motion control. So I can, I can control now with my fingertips so I can float here. Um, I'm sitting in the middle of the module or I use my feet a lot to move myself around. Uh, you end up being a little bit like a primate. You use your, your feet to um, stabilize yourself a lot of times. Uh, you're kind of swinging around sometimes uh, from tree branch to tree branch up here. And uh, we're learning how to do all of that when we first get up here. So that was harder. Uh, some of the things that have been easier than expected were a lot of the things that uh, we've been just training for years. So... Things like robotic operations and EVA, um, all of our science experiments, none of those are easy, but they are familiar territory. I think it's something that NASA does an incredible job in preparing the astronauts how to train and how to fly. Right. So let's talk about one of those experiments, which really was a milestone. For the first time, you successfully sequenced DNA in a spacecraft. So two questions. One, why is it so difficult to do that, and why has it taken this long to do it? And what are the implications of being able to do it? Why is that important? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple reasons that this is really critical. One is that we're testing out the ability to do really remote science. Um, and and I mean really remote. We're off the planet. Uh, this is important, actually, for Earth. I used to work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I worked on monkeypox um, and uh, also spent a number of years working on Ebola. We've, we've had outbreaks of both of these diseases. The ability to rapidly determine viral sequence in a setting where you have no power grid uh, almost no internet communication, no infrastructure whatsoever. If you can overcome those kinds of engineering challenges in order to send something to the space station, uh, it is very adaptable to these sorts of remote locations on the planet. The other reason we want to start doing that is to understand how sequencing works off the planet. And I, I mentioned about fluids behaving. They behave in very unexpected ways up here. Uh, just uh, basic things uh, like pushing fluid out of a drink bag will be an amazing property that I have never seen uh, liquids behave in that way on Earth. So it's not uh, completely well understood how the liquids were going to behave in a fluidic system needed for sequencing. Uh, it's also not completely understood if this was even going to work at all. It's actually a pretty complex set of experiments to get this up here and then to get the data back down to Earth. So we have proven that, that we can use this technology in microgravity, uh, now really the world of sequencing and molecular biology is opened up to us on a space station. So we can use this to do real-time analysis of things like the microbiome on the space station, uh, cellular function and structure in orbit. You can imagine if cells are in free fall, rather than sitting at the bottom of a plastic dish their function may be greatly affected. Their structure may be affected. We can study all of those uh, types of things with modern molecular biology tools. The first thing is you have to show that this can work off the planet. Thank you. Now, in August, you conducted your first spacewalk. Is there any possible way that you can try to help our listeners appreciate what that experience is like? That's pretty hard because I didn't even have a very good understanding of that myself before I went out the door. And I worked at NASA and trained uh, in a giant pool underwater for seven years first. So it is, um, I would say, more awesome, amazing, and terrifying than you can possibly imagine to be in the vacuum of space in a spacesuit. Uh, the, the incredible thing I actually found was... 
uh, that our spacesuits function like their own spacecraft. And they have uh, systems that report to us. We have teams of folks on the ground that are watching you in your spacesuit uh, perform this really critical work. Uh, we installed the international docking adapter to the front of space station. We retracted a radiator uh, and reduced some of our risk for orbital debris. And one thing uh, that folks may be really interested in is some high definition cameras. So we can actually get some incredible views of the planet and the space station. Uh, so all these tasks were, they were really important and they're, it's absolutely critical to execute that right. Um, so you're balancing uh, doing a perfect job and also looking at the planet through nothing but your visor and uh, trying to just take it all in and, and think how amazing it is that you're floating in space, hanging on to the edge of the International Space Station. Extraordinary. The space station now has been occupied continuously for 16 years, almost 16 years. Can you characterize for us, just in a nutshell, why is the space station still so important? I think the um, simple one-sentence answer is this is the only laboratory where we can study microgravity as a variable. Uh, the other really unique thing about space station is the radiation environment. We can't perform these some of these experiments on Earth. Uh, we have, for example, beams that will take a look at one specific heavy particle of radiation, but we can't simulate right now the complex radiation environment in low Earth orbit. As you get farther into space uh, and are less protected by Earth's magnetic fields, you're subject to even more and more radiation. So it's interesting, it's interesting for NASA from a human health performance and exploration standpoint. It's really interesting for people on Earth because we are understanding and making new discoveries about fundamental biological, physical, material science aspects of things some of these experiments we just can't do on the planet. So this laboratory has been operated and staffed for an incredible number of years, um, and there is still an incredible number of years of work to do up here. One last question. You'll be back on Earth soon. What are you most looking forward to? Well, I'm really looking forward to uh, landing, uh, seeing the sun a little bit, feeling the uh, feel of, of wind. There's a lot of things when you uh, are not on the planet, you don't know that you would miss them. And uh, when you suddenly move to a closed loop, uh, completely, I would say, isolated environment, uh, being on the planet sometimes sounds pretty good in terms of being able to experience uh, even things like rain that you might take for granted and be annoyed that you're in a rainstorm. Uh, you know, think about astronauts who don't get rain for quite a few months. I think uh, everything that feels like being outside sounds very appealing. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the KZSU radio portion of the event.